Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that it's perfect, that it's powerful, that it's effective. God, that it is um, even effective on someone such as myself, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that your word is alive and active. Well, I just pray that it uh, be rest that it fall on good fertile ground. Lord, I come before you in your name, rebuking the whisperer, the distractor, the divider. Father, um, don't let any evil spirit steal this word. Let it be planted in fertile ground in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So, you know, one of the things that I, I realized and just saying a little something about Father's Day, because it is Father's Day, I wanted to do a Father's Day message. <coughs> And I wanted to do one called You Didn't Marry Jesus. I wanted to explain to all the women that have a man that their man is not Jesus. Stop setting a standard that high and have more tolerance. But I couldn't do that because the Lord had another message. But if we look at the state of society, you can unwind it all the way to men not taking care of their families. Amen. Not putting God first then putting their wife next, and then putting their children next, and then putting their church. See, God is a God of order, and we can see how that our nation has fallen apart. And hey, listen, I'm guilty. I have lived a life that I wasn't the father or the husband that God called me to be. That's not my message, but what I do want to say is as Marilyn and I off and on parent people a lot of times. There's a lot of folks in their 20s and 30s that didn't have a good dad, don't have a good dad, don't know their dad, don't, and what do we do? It is our job as the church to fill in that position. Because as much as I like to tell you about the Heavenly Father, the only way I know the Heavenly Father is by someone demonstrating the Heavenly Father. Amen. Follow me for a second. So your kid's perception of God depends on their perception of you. So as a earthly father, they understand who God is based on who you are and how you act, how you fulfill your role. And if you married a woman with a kid, I've had to explain this several times, I said you didn't just marry her, you married her and her children. As much as my Hannah and Heather will let me, I try to live, I try to be a father to them. If they break down on the side of the road, I go get them. If they need money, they contact First National Daddy and their name goes on the spreadsheet with a, a real low interest rate, but an interest rate. No, that turns an interest. They do. Back up. But uh, we fill in that role. It is important that we as a church become the dads, the spiritual dads, of a couple generation of orphans. Orphans. Men really have. We, we, we've got it flipped. We're seeking stuff and not seeking a relationship with God. I'll never forget a time Christian had done something good. I can't remember what it was because he didn't do a whole lot of good things. But uh, he had done something good and, and he wanted this video game. He was about eight years old or seven. I don't remember. Anyway, he was little. And he really wanted this video game. But I asked him, so let me ask you a question. Daddy usually works six days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. But I'm taking off. I'm going to be off this Sunday. And I'm not really too high. or I hadn't really been up for too many days straight on drugs. I, I've had a pretty easy week. So I feel like I can either buy you the video game or we could go play golf. Emphatically, he said, let's go play golf. Neither one of us can play golf, but we had a good time. But what did he want? Your kids don't want stuff. They want you. That was a hard lesson for me to understand. I'll never forget post-prison, the getting a job back in the car business six days a week. And I looked at the boss. I said, listen, I understand. You're paying me really well, but if my son has a ball game on Friday or if my girls are cheering on Saturday, I will not be here. I got a little contention one time because I had a preaching appointment scheduled and somehow we made it into the playoffs and Christian had a football game and I canceled the preaching appointment. People said, you're putting football. Well, no, I'm not putting football before my child. I don't even like football. What I am putting is I'm putting my child before ministry. 
Because that has nothing to do with my relationship with God. Is ministry important? Yes, it's important. But for the young fathers, let me encourage you. Be the example. If you got a daughter, imagine your daughter marrying you at 21 years old. Lord, help the fellow. He probably wouldn't make it real long. <clears throat> and I say that sincerely. <laughs> as messed up as it is. But we're going to talk about this morning about a sermon called Repossessed. It's something that's been on my heart for a while. I've been working on it for a couple of weeks. And, and you know, God works in mysterious ways. And a lot of times God will begin to download uh, ministers, even in different parts of the country, will begin to get downloads from the same Holy Spirit. Y'all know that, right? Yeah. The same Holy Spirit that's here is the same Holy Spirit that's talking to the pastor in Los Angeles or in Nashville. So when I leave here today, we'll go and it's Father's Day. Uh, but usually when I leave here today, I go turn on my favorite pastor, the guy that I lean on, the guy that I look to. And I turned on his sermon Wednesday when I left church and he was preaching this topic. It's a topic, it's a point that I don't know if I've ever heard preached before. I, I don't know if I've ever heard it explained this way. I've touched on it, but I want you to understand, I sincerely believe that God has a specific word for the people that are here today and the people that watch later on concerning the topic of repossess. So we're going to look at Matthew 12, 43 and 45, and I doubt we'll get to James 4, 4 through 8, so we'll probably just hang out in Matthew 12, 43 through 45. And we're going to do what they call expository preaching. It's a form of preaching that details the meaning of a particular scripture or a particular passage. Let me tell you this. When you read an individual scripture and try to apply that scripture to your life, you're making a mistake because the Bible was not written in scriptures. It was written in passages, paragraphs, books, and letters. So I can pull a scripture out of context. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. I can come up with the idea that somehow I can dunk a basketball if I have enough faith. I don't like basketball. I'm not going to try to dunk one. The only way I'm going to dunk one is if we lower the goal. I'm not going to jump because I know it's going to hurt when I land. But I can take that scripture out of context and apply it and put it all, all over every weight room in America. They got a hack squat machine. And I've always envisioned and wanted to hack squat 700 pounds at 175. That's like four times your body weight. I got 675 at about 180. Now that I'm down to 170 pounds, I have no desire to ever lift that much weight again. But I had that idea. But me trying to apply all things to that idea is misapplying the scripture. Paul was in jail. Things were hard. Not these soft county jails, and I don't know, not some county jails are worse than others. Not these federal prisons that I was in, but Paul was locked up when he wrote that. He's saying, listen, I'm suffering for Christ, and I can do it because Christ is going to strengthen me to suffer. So we see ourselves taking passages and applying them out of context. And this scripture, Matthew 12, 43 through 45, has been so taken out of context, we need to get the context right. I've heard some people say, well, that scripture means something totally different for me. You know, that's a bunch of hogwash. You know that, right? All scripture has one interpretation. It may have many applications, but there's only one interpretation. When I begin to try to look at some secret point in the scripture, I am acting like a Mormon. And next thing you know, I'm going to be talking to the angel Baloney or Baroni or whatever he was. That's a Gnostic view of scriptures. The scriptures are not that hard to understand. Do I grow in my understanding? Do I grow in my revelation? Do I get a deeper? I hope so. If you're not growing in your understanding of scripture, you're not growing in Christ. And the enemy is watching you and he'll make you an easy target. How did Satan tempt Eve? How did he attempt to tempt Jesus? 
It's important that we know there's one interpretation because the way that Satan attempts people is by taking Scripture out of context. He started off with a half truth. If I tell you 99% of the truth, but it's a 1% lie, it's a total lie. God works in absolute truth. Josh and I were talking about a TikTok video or something we seen the other day, and they considered math racist. They said that because 4 plus 4 equals 8 as being objective truth, it may equal 9 to somebody else. No, there is one truth, and 4 plus 4 will always be 8. Regardless of what you think. But we live in a world today where they want to accept anything as truth. Living my truth. Well, go on and live your truth. Judgment day is coming. Amen. I got to live God's truth. I know uh, um, Rachel challenged me one time because she knows we've helped many uh, uh, gay women get into rehab and, and helped them and loved on them, had them to her house. They come visit church with us. And she challenged me one day. She said, well, Daddy, you have these gay friends. I said, I don't have to uh, agree with their lifestyle to love them. And I live my life based on my idea of right and wrong. I live my life on subjective right and wrong. And that put me in prison. Because, man, I'm slick. I can justify all kinds yeah. of things. But if, when I decided to live my life between Genesis and Revelation, things greatly improved. I was able to sleep at night. You know, you've got to think, how do you make $50,000 in one month running a car lot? I mean, we were taking advantage of people by the groves. How do you do that? How do you, how do, you do that? By, by the love of money. By, by justifying the little things. And as the little things amplified and grew, they got bigger and bigger. And then the next thing you know, the fed showed up at the house. But when this scripture has been taken out of context, it has really discouraged people from getting free from demonic influence and scared them into thinking that every time they have the slightest sinful thought, yeah. the enemy has reattached itself to them and, and the, start, the torment starts all over again. Never forget that it is the enemy that brings fear. Now there is... A fear of God. And there's the fear that the enemy brings. But see, if I don't understand my relationship with God, my identity in Christ, I see God as a mean, vicious, condemning God with a hammer waiting on me to mess up. Just like the prodigal son, when you mess up, God is waiting for you to get back on the path and come home. He's not wanting to hurt you. God didn't send His only Son to die for you so He can hurt you every time you have a sinful thought. That's not the God we serve. Is that a God? It's a little G God, absolutely. And we learn in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is an actual Identity are a entity without a body. It is a spirit. A timid, a, tim, a, a timid being or cowardice. You know, when you read Revelation 21 and 8, it talks about the people that ain't going to make it to heaven. <clears throat> and one of the words that it uses is the coward. There's coming a time in our life and it's approaching quickly where we're going to have to be brave to stand against the pressure. And already in some places in our country, what we believe in, uh, the, the Jude excluding Christ out of the equation, going back to the forefathers, looking at us as the Judeo-Christian beliefs, that they have been thrown away. And to believe that is going to put a target on our back. And in some parts of the country, it's already that bad. We already are outcasts, and it's only going to get worse. But since he didn't give me a spirit of fear, what did he do? He gave me a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Anything in Scripture that puts a spirit of fear in you is a Scripture taken out of context. 
So fear the Lord. Yes, I do fear the Lord. You know what? I feared my daddy too. And it was a good fear. It was a good fear. Your child should be afraid that you're going to wear them out when they act bad. They should be afraid. Discipline hurts. It's supposed to hurt. You know what? When God disciplines me, it hurts. It's supposed to hurt. <clears throat> fear of the Lord and the fear of the enemy produces in us. It, in that fear is, is when we allow the enemy's lies to become our deception. Because the scripture is taken so out of context, they're afraid. People are afraid to even go through deliverance, thinking that if they slip up one time, have one simple thought, more evil demons are going to come rushing back in and torment them. They figure that they'll just keep the little demons and live with the demons they have. Because of the way that we've understood this scripture in the past, Christians remain under the lie, under the illusion that somehow that they're too righteous and too holy, too much of a Christian to be influenced by a demon. We need to slow down and look at what these verses mean. So what is the literal interpretation of Matthew 12, 43 through 45? Context is key. key. Who was Jesus speaking to? Who was speaking? It was Jesus speaking. He was speaking to the religious leaders of the day. What was going on culturally? What was going on in the time? A Messiah showed up that didn't look like they thought he should look. Jesus was born in Nazareth, which was the wrong side of the tracks. What good can come out of Nazareth? Rumors had still been circulating about Mary getting pregnant. Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit, but other people didn't understand that. They thought that she had committed premarital sex. They thought she got pregnant before she got married, which then carried the penalty of being taken outside the camp and having rocks thrown at you till you were dead. So those rumors were spreading that that's Jesus from Nazareth. These are the carpenters. His daddy died young. His mama got pregnant. They're nothing. That this guy can't be the Messiah. They'd already made up their mind based on his past. That already made up their mind based on his family. They're already made up their mind based on a lie. He was a blue collar fellow, a carpenter. Not an educated elitist. How can this guy be the Messiah? And Isaiah tells us that he just wasn't a good looking man. He was comely. He was average. He was homely. And he didn't fit their idea of what a Messiah would look like. So when we look at this, we see Jesus, this Messiah, the, the incarnation of God. The manifest presence of God standing right in front of the religious leaders of the day and they chose their tradition over the presence of God that stood before them. So Jesus, he confronted them. Where we see Jesus saying verily, verily in scriptures, that means Jesus was hollering. Don't get it, Mishka. Jesus was not a soft Buddha type man running around. Jesus was a hard man. He did not mince words. He had a mission. He stayed on point. He did what God, Jesus got along and talked to his father. And then after he talked to his father, the Holy Spirit gave him the power to carry out what God had told him to do. How much more do I need to talk to my father and yield to the Holy Spirit? So when I look at back at verse 38, Their desire was for him to do a miraculous sign of his authority. And in verse 39, it says, Only an evil and adulterous generation would demand such a miraculous sign. So what do you mean? We got, we got people. You remember the, the Bible that leaked oil and then they figured out it, was, it wasn't real? It was, it was bogus. They, they figured it out. That it, you know, people driving all the way. Don't go chasing signs. Amen. Don't go chasing that kind of stuff. Chase an intimate relationship with the Word of God. Amen. You know, I'm not saying don't visit. We went to Argo Church of God a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night because God told me that a man I'd never laid eyes on before in my life had a word for me. I went and I got a word. He pulled me out of the crowd. 
You know, this guy pastors a huge church. He said, hey, you have changed my mind on doctrinal issues that, that you've changed my mind on some of the things that I believe from your social media posts. I'm like, well, that's cool. We're actually going to lunch this Thursday. So this scripture applies to a generation. And it also applies to people that get free from demonic possession and don't get saved. So let's look at the scripture. Now, when the unclean, this is Matthew 12, 43. Now, when the unclean spirit comes out of a person, so we see it coming out, I am a spirit being who possess a soul, my mind, will, and emotion that live in a physical body. So somehow in the spiritual realm, we see a connection of evil spirits connecting and grasping and clenching on to people. And so when it comes out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest. Now there's a lot of debate on what are demons. There's scriptures that tell us that the demons are already in hell. But we got something going on. We see them manifest around here all the time. There's something going on. It is in my opinion that these demons are actually the disembodied spirits of Nephilim. And the reason they don't like to be outside of a body is because they were created in a body. So they get real uncomfortable, so uncomfortable that they actually said, hey, cast us into the pigs. We don't want to be out of a body. They're territorial. Don't send us out of this particular area. Demons are real. They're emphatically real. So they didn't want to go. So they leave a person. They go through this waterless, arid places, and they don't find it. So it does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it what? Unoccupied, swell, and put in order. So this unclean spirit, for some reason, leaves what it calls his house. Let me ask you a question. If someone breaks into your house, are they in your house? No. Is it their house? I mean, you know, I seen a thing the other day. Some poor lady was on overseas. And somebody just moved into her house. Set up shop. Here she is, she's a lieutenant colonel in the army, and she's over serving the country over, and she comes home and somebody's living in her house. She had to go through a lot of, of stuff legal to get the squatter out of her house. Because people just took up residence. Does bugs and roaches own your house? But do we all bring in a bag of potatoes every now and then and get a little roach? And go crazy, get the bingle out, the roach proof. Go absolutely start, you know, wiping everything down with bleach. Start, maybe not that bad. <laughs> but so it leaves and it goes through these dry and arid places, these waterless places. It says, I will return to my house. But when it comes back, it finds it unoccupied. It's swept and put in order. It's waiting. It's ready. It's empty. Then it goes and brings along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they come in and live there. And the last condition of the person becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. So we get a lot of context by that last phrase, this evil generation. I've heard people preach the scripture and say that if a saved person isn't fully committed to filling their temple with the Holy Ghost after they go through deliverance, that they will be repossessed by seven more wicked spirits. Listen, that's not true. That is not true. It's important. Is it important that we keep our minds filled with the things of God? Yes. Is it important that we don't allow our minds to be filled with the things of the world? Of course. I meditate on Scripture. I don't empty myself in some mystical type of meditation. I fill my mind with the things in the Word of God. Yeah. And then there's no room for the lie. Right. Because the devil, he's never going to stop lying. Yeah. 
If the devil was going to stop lying, it would have told me to take the shield of faith and withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. Can the devil send thoughts my way? Yeah. It's up to you whether to believe them or not. If you don't understand who you are in Christ, you will believe the lie. That's the reason I've given out hundreds of victory over darkness books. And we still got people struggling that hadn't read the book. And you're trying to figure out why you're struggling. Let me tell you why you're struggling. You don't know who you are in Christ. If you know who you are in Christ, you won't struggle. Will you have challenges? Yes. But you'll be able to stand tall in the challenges. You'll be able to say, hey, God said I can make it through this. There's got to be some reason this has to work out for my good. I don't know how God is going to see me through it, but he's going to see me through it when I know who I am. But when I don't know who I am, and how many people really know who they are, I mean, really think about it. We live in a world where people don't know who they are. They don't know who, what their purpose is. They don't know what their identity is. They ain't got a clue. They're trying to find it. Everybody's trying to find their purpose. Let me give you a purpose. Glorify God with your life and everything works out for your benefit. Amen. This scripture, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. Listen, if you're not following the, the precepts of God, if you're not pursuing a relationship with God, all things do not work out for your good. Amen. Your life becomes turmoil and mess. So this scripture is speaking of a generation. Best I can tell, speaking of this generation. Last week I talked about the recent Barna poll about post-pandemic biblical worldview. I'm not going to get into all of that, but we've come up with this syncretical or syncretical, like a synchronized worldview. It involves the merging or assimilation of several originally separate traditions, especially in theology and mythology of religion, thus asserting an underlying unity and allowing for an inclusive approach to other faiths. So, yeah, you do you, I'll do me, I'll see you in heaven. No, no, no. Jesus is the only way to heaven. I'm sorry. It is offensive if you're raised a Buddhist or if you, if, you got a, if you got somebody that's following, trying to follow God another way. I understand, but what are you going to do? Sometimes we need to be offensive. Our gospel is offensive. Jesus offended everybody that hated the truth because he was the truth. 96% of Americans now deny the gospel of Christ, believing that there are multiple ways to reconcile with God. 96%. 91% of folks who go to church now deny the gospel, believing there are multiple ways to reconcile with God. 63% of senior pastors and 88% of children's and youth pastors now deny the gospel of Christ, believing that there are multiple ways to reconcile with God. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, as we talked about last week, this is the great apostasy. It said that day shall not come until there is a great apostasy, a falling away. What does it mean to fall away? That means that I used to believe this, now I believe something else. That's accepting the lie, that is taking the lie of the enemy and letting it become deception. And then I fall in this vicious, vicious cycle. It is sin that empowers demons. Societal sin, personal sin, and generational or family sin. I don't like the generational and family sin. There's a lot of times I'm praying with people and the demons that are attached to them were there from birth. That should tell you fathers to break the curse over your children. Let me tell you how to not get demonized. Live a life of repentance. You know what a life of repentance looks like? You evaluate yourself when you do wrong. You confess it. If you know you're struggling with something, struggle. Let me tell you the difference between struggling and acceptance. If I'm struggling with sin, I am looking to overcome the sin. I'm doing whatever it takes to overcome the sin. If it means getting a flip phone, I get a flip phone. If it means staying away from a computer, whatever sin I'm struggling with, I make a commitment if I'm truly committed to overcoming the sin. If not, and you're unrepentant, your children suffer. No, look, look, look. I, I'm a living example of it. Out of six of our children, two of them are here. Why? Because daddy was an idiot. Because I made mistakes. Because I lived my life for me. Because money was more important than them. 
Because success was the most important thing. How people viewed me, people fearing me and respecting me was more important than getting up on Sunday morning and taking my kids to church. That's the truth. Now what do I do now? I live a life of repentance. I pray for them. You see me in this church crying, I'm either praying for somebody or I'm praying for my kids. I wake up in the middle of the night praying for my kids. I go to bed at night praying for my kids. I get up in the morning praying for kids. And my kids, let me tell you something, I pray for a lot of y'all too. There's literally times I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll be praying for Jacob and Paige and Malik and Emily. Be praying for different ones. Just wake up out of a dead sleep in prayer. Why? Because that's how I went to sleep. It says pray without ceasing. So if you want to break that generational curse over your children, live a life of repentance. As this country has quickly rejected God and morality, darkness has started gaining influence at an alarming rate. Romans 5.20 says, Where sin is increased, grace abounded all the more. The darker the world gets, the brighter we shine in the darkness. Our country is no longer found what was founded, but is no longer based on Judea Christian values. It is a pagan nation. And this is why I'm wrestling with people downstairs multiple times a week as they phase out in some kind of demonic trance. This is why we've seen this uptick in, deny, in demonization of people because we have kicked God and his values out of our country. That's what this scripture means. We kicked him out and the pagan gods have come back and it's seven times worse than it was before. As believers, our temples are not empty. If your temple is empty, you know what kill me? This is an old poll I'd hate to see. 76% of Christians said they're not born again. No, I'm not a born again Christian. I'm just a Christian. If you're not born again, if you don't have, if you're not a temple of the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. You may be a little C Christian. You may be in the Christian club. You may be a Jesus fan, but you're not a Jesus follower. You're not a new creation. Old things have not passed away. Behold, all things have not become new. So where do those people go on judgment day? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. But I was a Christian. I got baptized. There's no newness of life. There's no relationship with God. So he comes back and he says he finds it unoccupied. Christians cannot be possessed. They cannot be owned because we have the Holy Spirit in us. So just a couple of verses that demonstrate that. 1 Corinthians 3.16 don't you do not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You say, Ron, I don't understand. If I can't be possessed, what's happening to Christians? Let me tell you something. If you get somebody that truly has not a relationship with God that's been practicing witchcraft and we, we've, I don't know if we've ever really confronted someone that was truly possessed. You, you start looking at some of those files. Start looking at the medical records on those folks. Paranormal things happen. But people that have a relationship with God, they can be influenced. They can be attached. And sometimes somebody has to stand between that person and hell and look at the devil and say, you don't own them. God owns them. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to release your influence from them. But if you're saved, you cannot be owned. But the whole possession, oppression, demonic influence is sort of goofy because none of those words are really in the Bible. When I look at Mark 1.32, Now when evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and all those who were demon-possessed. Where did Jesus start his ministry of deliverance? If we look at Mark, the first chapter, he said he went from temple to synagogue to synagogue delivering those that were demonically influenced. So what? how do we understand demon possess? Well, possess is not in the Greek. It means to be under the influence, under the power of a demon. How do I? Okay, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I'm confident that I'm saved, but I have a desire to hurt myself. 
But the Bible says that no man hurts his own flesh. Where did I get that idea? Where did I get that idea? Where did I get that idea? Let me tell you where you got that idea. A devil has got close enough to you and lied to you long enough. You believe the lie. His lie become your deception. Now you need somebody to stand between you and the enemy and command him to release himself. This demonization ranges from slight suggestion to, to full on you're not good enough states of uh, depression. But absolute and total control happens to folks who do not have a relationship with God. If you wanted to say that an unsaved person was who was <coughs> having issues with the demon, demon, if you wanted to call them possessed, I guess that would be appropriate. <clears throat> if Christians could not be under the influence of demon, how does the subject of spiritual warfare even apply in our lives? The truly saved people cannot be possessed. Matthew 12, 43 and 45 does not ap apply to believers. We'll read James 4, and we'll pick up there next week. Uh, I'm going to preach the first Sunday, and Josh is going to preach the second Sunday. You adulterers, die. Uh, I'm going to actually read it out of NLT. Don't bear with me. Because can a believer open a door and be re-influenced by demons? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. You can get set free today, open a door, and be re-influenced. And you can do it over and over and over again. It's important that we close the doors. And James 4 sums it up pretty well. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Do they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you do not have what you want because you do not ask God. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Follow me here. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God? I'm friends with the unbelievers. I'm the enemy of the world system that produces lies and deception in both unbelievers and believers' lives. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy with God. Do you think that scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within you should be faithful to him. He gives us grace generously. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7 sums up the entire message of deliverance completely. So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So when I come to God, I come humbly. What, what is humility? What, what, do we even, you know, th there's words that we don't use in news articles and stuff. Anymore, Y'all know that, right? Words sort of fade away. Humility is one of them. We don't teach our kids humility. We need to teach our kids humility. We teach our kids to stand up for themselves. We teach our kids to fight. Well, sometimes they just need to walk in humility because a soft answer does what? It turns away wrath. So when we come to God, we come to Him Humbly, what does that mean? That means you're saying, God, I don't have it figured out. I need help. God, help me. But if I do that and there is the devil, he will flee from me. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your idolatry is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up in honor. 
But in this world, we just do just the opposite. Sin is celebrated. Absolutely celebrated. It is celebrated today. So we talked about that we needed faith in who we are and the authority to understand and realize the power that God has given us to, to just like Jesus did, tell demons to go. Look, if you need physical healing, I'm all about it. I'll pray for you. But I'm much more interested in your spiritual growth than your emotional healing. You know, because Jesus said, if your arm, hand offends you, chop it off. It's much more important that you make it to heaven with one hand and one leg and one eye than to burn in hell forever. And then, as we continue with this, in order to stay off the influence of the demons, we have to look holy. And holy has nothing to do with the color of your hair, has nothing to do with how many holes you have in your blue jeans. The most unholy, meanest, ugliest people I've ever seen never put on an ounce of makeup. Let me tell you, they needed makeup. Because they were on the outside and the inside. And they were mean. Holiness is something that comes from the inside. Holiness allows you to look at somebody and see past the worst sin and see that person created in the image and the likeness of God who is broken. Holiness allows you to have empathy for that person. Holiness keeps you from judging them based on their actions and decisions. Holiness will prompt you to love that person not just with words but in deeds also. So I want uh, whoever's handling the altar call, please come. You know, I'm, I'm not one to beg people to the altar. I just, I don't know. I've seen preachers uh, manipulate and beg and control and stand. And I don't like none of that stuff. But I want you to know, if you're struggling with something or not sure... I challenge you to come just say, God, okay, show me. Show me. If you're real, show me. If you can really help me overcome this, show me. If, 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 if you're real, God, if you're real, just like the Bible says, show me. I want to see. I want to know. So if you're struggling with anything or need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for healing, anything that you need, I just encourage you to come as they say.